All right, guys, so in this example here, we're working with R134A entering into a well-insulated nozzle at 200 PSI, 220 degrees Fahrenheit, and a velocity of 120 feet per second. We're told it exits at 20 PSI. We have the velocity at the inlet, or sorry, the velocity at the exit of 1,500 feet per second, and we're working at steady state, neglecting potential energy, and we're looking for that final temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So let's begin by drawing our schematic. So we'll have a nozzle looking something like this. going from a larger area to a smaller area. Of course, the working fluid here is going to be R134A. And we'll call this here area 1, which is the inlet. And we'll call this here area 2, which is the exit. And again, we have the pressure at the inlet, 200 pound force per square inch, also known as PSI. We have the temperature at the inlet, which is 220 degrees Fahrenheit. We have the velocity at the inlet, V1, as 120 feet per second. We have the uh, pressure at the exit, P2, as 20 PSI. And we have the velocity at the exit, V2, as 1,500 feet per second. And, you know, that makes sense, right? You have high pressure at the inlet of the nozzle, in low velocity and then at the exit of the nozzle you lose all your pressure you only have 20 psi but that velocity shoots way up to 1500 also we know that this nozzle is well insulated right so that pretty much means that we have no heat transfer so we can go ahead and mention that here so we have q dot equals zero so to find that temperature at the exit which we're looking for as t2 so we'll write down that t2 T2 equals some number, and it's going to be in degrees Fahrenheit. So to find that, we need to have another thermodynamic property of that R134A at the exit at state 2. Right now, we have one thermodynamic property being 20 pound-feet per uh, square inch, or I should just say PSI. Uh, the velocity is not actually something that you can use to get you to the property table. However, this velocity is useful because it tells us the kinetic energy, which when we apply the first law of thermodynamics and, and balance out all the energies we're going to eventually be able to find this temperature. Um, specifically, we're going to probably look for the enthalpy because we look for the heat content and relate that to the temperature. So let's just go ahead and write down that first law formula. So we know that zero equals the heat transfer minus the power plus the mass flow rate times all the stuff over here. Your difference in enthalpy, H1 minus H2. Always remember what comes in minus what comes out. So you have to add your heat energy, which is your enthalpies. You have to add your kinetic energies, which is going to be V1 squared minus V2 squared. These being your velocities divided by 2. And we're going to add our potential energy being Z1 minus Z2. Sorry for making it a little messy over here. But in essence, this is our first law of thermodynamics equation here. And we can make some simple simplifications here because we know that uh, we have a well-insulated nozzle, so therefore we can go ahead and cross out our heat transfer. Also, there's no power production or um, consumption here because we don't have a no we don't have a, a compressor here. We don't have a pump, something consuming power. We don't have a turbine to produce any electricity or or power or work. So we can go ahead and cross out our power function there, our power variable. And what else can we cross out? Well, we know that this is a nozzle and it's horizontal. And actually, we're told that we can neglect potential energy, so I'm just going to go ahead and cross out the potential energy here. So now if we simplify this, we'll have that 0 equals the mass flow rate times the change in enthalpy plus the change in kinetic energy or velocity. Now, if you make an astute observation here, you'll see that you have V1 given, you have V2 also given. And then you can find your H1 because you have two thermodynamic properties being your pressure and your temperature. So we definitely can, we can just check these off. So we have the enthalpy at one, we have the velocity at one, and we have the velocity at two. Now, the only two missing uh, variables here are going to be your mass flow rate and your and your enthalpy, but if you notice, you just divide both sides by your mass flow rate, and you're actually able to get rid of it. So we can cross out our mass flow rate here, and you actually don't need it for this problem. 
And if you don't believe me, what you could do is you could distribute this mass flow rate to both of these variables here, to both of these functions here, these expressions, and you'll have the enthalpy times the mass flow rate and the velocities times the mass flow rate and move on to the other side and you're going to have an m dot on both sides and you can divide both sides by the mass flow rate to also get rid of it. So now let's rewrite what we have here. So we have zero equals and we'll have, I'm just going to start searching for our variables now. So we have h1 and now how do we find h1? Well we have 200 psi and 220 degrees Fahrenheit so if we turn over here to table A11E, the saturated tables for R134A, we can see where we're at. So if we go to our pressure of, we have 200 PSI, so right over here, you have a saturation temperature of 132.27 Fahrenheit. So now what does that mean? Does that mean that we're superheated? Are we in this two-phase region? Um, so let's figure that out. So if we draw a TH diagram, we'll have our uh, T in degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll have our H in kilojoules per kilogram. We'll draw our vapor dome, something like this. And then we'll draw our uh, constant pressure line, something like that. So anywhere along that line is 200 PSI. Of course, this here is going to be your saturated liquid. And here is going to be your saturated vapor region. Anywhere to the right of this dome is going to be superheated. Anywhere to the left is going to be a compressed liquid. And you have your two-phase in between. So we have a saturation temperature of 125.28. So we're at 200 PSI. So 125.28. So we'll go ahead and draw that over here. And this is going to be your TSAT, your saturation temperature. And like we said, I'm just going to circle it because I keep looking back at this. Of 125.28. degrees Fahrenheit. We already have that written up here. So 125.28, but we were given a, f um, a temperature of 220 Fahrenheit here. So 220 Fahrenheit is more like somewhere over here. So we'll say this, is, this here is 220. And if I draw a horizontal line and meet where we are here, I'll have to ex extend this a little bit. We're somewhere right here, but point being that you're to the right of the vapor dome, so you're definitely in that superheated region. So that tells us that we can't use any of the enthalpies from this table here because this is, of course, saturated R134A and we're not saturated, we're superheated. So I'm going to turn over here to table A12E. We're going to look for 200 PSI. We have 200 PSI and we have 220 Fahrenheit. So let's see if that's available on this table. And we have 220 Fahrenheit here, 200 PSI. So therefore, our enthalpy being the third column here is 144.15. Uh, BTU per pound being the unit up here. So I'll go ahead and fill that in over here. So we have 144.15 and we're going to subtract H2. So we'll say minus H2, which is our unknown. We have a single unknown in this uh, equation here. So we'll, we're fine with that. Actually, I'll go ahead and put the units in here as well. So we have BTU per pound. Close that bracket. Actually, I'm going to say pound mass because when we deal with BTU per pound, we're talking about BTU per pound mass, similarly to when we work with SI, where we're working with kilojoules per kilogram. And I don't want to confuse having pound mass and pound force, so I'm going to say pound mass. So now we add the change in velocity, so we have 120 feet per second, and we square that, subtract from that our exit of 1,500 feet per second, and we're going to square that, divide both of these by 2, and we can close our bracket. I'll actually move our h2 to the other side here, and we'll have that h2 equals 144.15 BTU per pound mass plus 120 feet per second squared minus 1,500 feet per second squared, divide all that by 2. And now before we just plug this into our calculator to find our uh, exit enthalpy there, and eventually we're going to extrapolate our temperature from that, we have to make sure that our units here are consistent. So we have BTU per pound mass, and we have feet squared per second squared. So let's break down our derived units being BTU into our base units being pound mass, feet, and seconds. So if we look at the BTU per pound mass unit, 
we can break it down by saying that 1 BTU is 778.17. And this is a weird unit here, but feet times pound force divided by pound mass. So all I did was I broke down the BTU unit here into feet times pound force, which is still not into base units because pound force is different than pound mass, and that's why I like to differentiate when I can. Uh, this is a unit of force similar to a newton, while a pound mass is a unit of mass similar to a kilogram. So what is a pound force? So a pound force is 32.174 pound mass feet per second squared. So now if we consolidate all of this down, we, we basically have that 1 BTU per pound mass equals 778.17 times 32.174. And what are our units here? So we already converted that pound force into base units and we have a pound mass on the top and a pound mass on the bottom those will cancel out and then we're left with feet squared here and feet squared or sorry feet there and feet there and those go into feet squared and then you have a second squared which is going to go down to the bottom so your unit here is basically going to be the product of these two numbers times feet squared per second squared so in order to get feet squared per second squared like you have on the right side here, you have to add a conversion factor either to here by multiplying by 778.17 and 32.174, or you take the uh, velocities here and you can then say add it on the bottom here just by dividing by those two numbers. So we'll divide by 778.17 and 32.174. And now in doing so, now I can finally add my 144.15 to these and get consistent units being BTU per pound mass. So we'll have that H2 equals 99.5 BTU per pound mass. And now we finally have two thermodynamic properties being H2 and we have P2 is 20. So now we'll turn to our saturated table for R134A being A11E. And once again, we have a pressure of 20 PSI, so right over here. And we have an enthalpy of 99.5 BTU per pound. Now you have your saturated liquid as 10.89 and your saturated vapor as 101.39. So you are very close to that saturated vapor uh, enthalpy, but you're still within these two numbers. So therefore, you are definitely in this two-phase region underneath the vapor dome. And therefore, you're going to have your temperature being equal to the saturation temperature because this temp the saturation temperature exists anywhere along this horizontal line, meaning that you have your T2 as negative 240, negative 2.48 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So we have T2 equals negative 2.48 degrees Fahrenheit.